Here's what you've been missing over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Patreon episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And uh, you know how we like to have uh, authors on uh, whenever we can. Um, And we've always done books that are history books. They're uh, grounded in uh, fact and reality. They're for your edumacation. But uh, today we have one that's kind of uh, a little bit of both. You can learn from it, but it is considered historical fiction. And uh, it's new. It just came out for the benefit of our first lieutenants watching it on the video here. It's called Brothers of War, uh, the Iron Brigade at Gettysburg. And um, it is. Uh, I've I've read a, a bit of it so far, and it's very good. Uh, and I'm not I'm not one to read fiction, so for me to say that is, um, well, that's rare. That's rare, and not that it matters what I say because who the hell am I? But for me, uh, it is a, is a good book. We have the author Michael Eisenhut here with us today. How are you doing, Michael? Hello, very good. Mike, I can call you Mike, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Because I've been, you. been calling Thank you, you that all week. Thank you for having me. I appreciate, appreciate <laughs> You're welcome. having me on the show. Absolutely. So um, let's uh, let's get started here with this book here. What what was your inspiration to write this book, and why as a fiction? Well, I, I, I've always loved the Civil War, reading about it, studying it, and uh, came to Gettysburg for years and years. But I think what, for this book, for the Iron Brigade, was, uh, I guess, maybe nine or ten years ago, seeing a grave up in the cemetery mm. that had my grandma's maiden name on it, uh, the last name Whitlow. Ooh, shit. And uh, after lots of Googling research, I learned everything I could about the 19th Indiana and the Iron Brigade. And uh, there weren't a whole lot of details about this specific soldier, this, this dead guy up in the National Cemetery. So I thought that'd be a great, great book. You know, right. I want to know. I want to know his story. When I saw his grave, I want to know his story. And I spent the next couple of weeks on Ancestry.com researching him and uh, to see if he was related. He is. He has a brother in the regiment also. And the two brothers. They have a third brother too, but he's fighting with the Third Indiana Cavalry somewhere else. And uh, I began writing a story. And uh, first, it was going to be nonfiction, but it didn't. It wasn't something that would really grab the reader. I didn't think, you know, it was. Uh, was there was there not a lot of information on these guys? Yeah, there, yeah, there was information about, a lot about the regiment of right. the nineteenth Indiana. There's several great books sure. out there, and there's you know, even more on the Iron Brigade. But these particular soldiers, no, there was very little, you know. So like no I, no family letters or diaries right, or anything right. like that. Okay. Nothing like that. I mean, yeah. you, you know, be my luck, a, a diary comes out, you know, after someone reads this <laughs> book. From, from it's like Oregon oh, I have his diary in my attic. But right, right now, no. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, you know, I pulled service records and. Uh, and all that stuff, everything I could do in the archives, and and all I could get was the day he died, and even the date of his death was all over the board. Right? Didn't you say it was like there's like four different dates of death or something like yeah, that? Yeah, there's July first, which okay. we know he was mortally wounded. July first. Okay. And, uh, there's July third. There's July fifth. There's July twelfth. And now, what are they saying has, that it has happened on all those different days? Well, I, I think. I think most of the soldiers from the Iron Brigade that were killed out in Herbst Woods, McPherson's Woods, uh, Reynolds Woods, whatever you want to call it out there, uh, out by Willoughby Run, I don't think they knew they were dead until the Union Army comes out on July 5th. Okay. So the date of death for most of those guys says July 5th. Got it. Yes. And there's. Uh, so they could have died outright on the 1st, or they could have lingered for a few days and right. then died there on the 4th or something like that. And- right. They just got to him too late. Right. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but one of my characters comes across a wounded, badly wounded Pennsylvania soldier from the 151st Pennsylvania, and he was wounded on the first. He's crawling to the rear, and his date of death even varies a little bit, mm, whether it's July okay. 1st or July 3rd, and you'd have to check them. You know. So what are the names of the uh, characters who are real? In this book, or the, so, the, the main, the you know. No, that's a good question. Yeah. So it's historical fiction. I'll say this. All the officers, they're real people. Right. I researched the hell out of this thing. Um, Colonel uh, Colonel Williams, Samuel Williams, Lieutenant Schlegel. Uh, these are 19th Indiana guys. Uh, Sergeant Major Asa Blanchard, 
uh, Abe Buckles, he was just a private <coughs> corporal, depending on which record you look at, um, Burlington Cunningham, these are all real people. Um, it's, uh, of course, General Doubleday or General Reynolds, Wadsworth, these guys, they're all real people. Mm -hmm. Now the squad of guys, um, the, the main characters in the book, some of those are real, and I added a couple that aren't real. Okay. Um, let's say, let's just say you have a really bad, oh, let's say a corporal, let's just say you have a really bad corporal, and you're gonna make this guy look bad in your in your book. Right. Well, you don't wanna do that about a real person. Correct. I think you kinda wanna be careful about that, so um, I didn't wanna take too much liberty with that, with using a real person and then changing what he said to make him look bad. Yeah. But I will say this, the brothers are real, of course. Um, so, and their names, they're Saul and James? Yeah, or? so it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, Solomon and James are okay. the two names of the two brothers. And they have another brother, John, who's an older brother fighting mm -hmm. with the 30 and calf. And you have other guys in the squad, or even the squad next to them in the com within the Company B of the 19th Indiana, uh, Greer Williams and uh, William Williams. His, it's his cousin. Those are real people. Mm -hmm. um, you, you may know, but a lot of the 19th Indiana guys from Company B were captured. All those names that my squad interacts with, those are real people. Mm -hmm. I didn't just go willy nilly and making up right. guys all over the right. place, you know, because that. So you actually like went through and picked out names of real. Yeah, men. right, and told their story through the eyes of my squad. What uh, introduced us to the characters in your squad? Uh, tell us about them, names and who okay. they are, what yeah. they're like. Right. So you have James Whitlow. He's uh, about 21. Uh, you have his younger brother, Solomon, who's with him, too. Um, you have Billy Williams, who just joins the regiment uh, around the Fredericksburg time, about six months before okay. Gettysburg or so, and his cousin Greer. And uh, another guy in the squad is uh, a guy named Elijah Hawkins. He's a... Uh, is that the one they call Hawk? They do call him Hawk. Uh -huh. when, he, when he signs up, he's Elijah. Okay. And uh, but quickly, he's kind of a rough guy. Um Kind of a ruffian. It's a little bit of a rascal, it yes. sounds like. Yes, a little bit of a tormentor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> brave as hell. Um, at the Battle of South Mountain, he, uh, as they're going up the National Road, and 19th Indian is put in the battle line to the left, they get behind boulders um, in the dark, and they're trying to uh, attack a line of Georgians up along a, behind a rock wall. And there's boulders that's steep. I don't know if you've been out there. I was actually out there today, strangely enough, at South Mountain and Tina. But Hawk, disappears in the dark to the left and they look up and there he is up the hill they see his silhouette on rock yelling come on come on come on so james goes and then solomon goes and pretty soon the whole squad and then the whole company goes and eventually the, the company b is able to dislodge uh, some of the guys up uh, some of the georgians up on uh, south mountain okay and of course you you may know that's where they the uh, iron brigade got its name mm -hmm. Yeah. So we back, back to the back to the it's squad. I mentioned right, most right. of those guys, mm -hmm. and, and there's a sergeant, uh, sergeant named uh, Bowler, Sergeant Bowler. He's in there too. He's kind of tough on the guys. They get to where they don't like him very much pretty quick. Who who's your favorite character and why? Which one was your favorite to write? Favorite to write would be, uh, you know, there were a couple. Lieutenant Schlegel. I I love his character, his personality, and I don't want to say what happens to him here, but. Um, yeah, he was he was fun to write. Hawk was incredibly fun to write. I'd love you know some of the things he did, and uh, not not just because he was. He, we had one character too I didn't mention named Henry. Henry was a Quaker uh, from uh, Richmond, Indiana. Had been friends with Solomon and James and John before the war, and uh, he he talks Solomon into enlisting, and then Solomon talks his brother into enlisting too, James, and uh, before. Henry has all these ideas when he signs up for the war, what it's about, and why he wants to fight. And by the time the battle started, like Bronner's Farm and Second Manassas, I mean, there's so much carnage. He's, you know, he's just devastated by it. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, he wants out. He's thinking about desertion. Um, I kind of just allude to that a little bit. I'm not going to say whether he deserts or he dies or, or lives here because I don't want to ruin the book for you. Yeah, because I, I was, Henry, I was Henry struggles. That. Henry struggles. Yeah. And as he's coming over East McPherson Ridge at Gettysburg, 
you know, he's shaking, he's scared. They're shoving him in the back. Keep going, Henry. Keep going. He's yeah. looking, he's looking off to the east towards town. Like I, I want out of here. There's you know? um well yeah. So is they're they're heading uh I guess it would be past the Bliss Farm or in that area there after yeah, they area. cut off the Emmitsburg Road. You, you describe him kind of his eyes darting left and right and everywhere, but in front of him trying to right. find a, a way to like maybe duck away to or something like that or something. I forgot how you worded it, but something like, you know, anywhere else to go or something else to do or right. something he's, like anywhere but here. He's looking for a way out. Yeah. And uh, the guys, I think he has Hawk in the line behind him. They're in a, they're in a column still running across the field. and. Uh, Hawks yelling, "Keep going, Henry!" And uh, right. Solomon grabs his arm and, "Come on, you know you, you, you're fine." He's having trouble breathing. He's, you know, he's really he's freaking out basically. Yeah, there's. Uh, let's see here at the top of page 150. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so more puffs of smoke came from the gray line ahead. Bullets screamed past. Steady. Henry fought for breath against uh, swelling fear. I don't know, he said with a screech, unable to finish his sentence. He was so scared, his legs felt like they would buckle. Keep going, Henry, Hawk shouted, uh, seeing Henry waver. Solomon noticed, too, leaning in and grabbing Henry's sleeve. He yelled, you're doing fine, Henry. We got him out in the open. Um, oh, he Henry wanted to turn and run, but feeling the men on each side of him, he knew he had no choice. He couldn't feel his legs and felt he'd almost or he uh, felt he'd lost control of his body, but somehow he still ran. Uh, wh everybody can relate to that, right? Right, because we've all been in a situation, not this per se, but we've all been in a situation where we're terrified. Right. You know, you think back when you're a little kid and like you're the new kid in school or something like that, and you're invited to a party because the kid's mom made him invite you, but you don't know anybody, right. and you're just terrified that everybody's going to ignore you and they're not going to talk to you. Oh, sure. And your mom's kind of nudging you along. Come on, come on, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And your legs. Your knees are wobbling like you don't it's you're just terrified. Right. Right. And I, that's to a kid. That's wor a fate worse than death. But these guys, they're going into a possible fate of death. They could be killed or at least right. maimed. Right. And so, yeah, like so that's what I like about this. These details. So now, let me ask you this about the details like well, that. Interrupt your oh, yeah. Go ahead. The, the next sentence is in the same paragraph. Momentum had them all. Yeah. You know, so I mean, well, right. these are guys from your town. This is your brother, your cousin, your, um, you know, maybe who knows? Maybe you're the, the shopkeeper in town who knows your dad is there. You know, yeah, so you, they're going. You know, you you have no choice. Shoulder to shoulder, you know, running in battle line up coming across East McPherson Ridge, you're not turning around. No, <laughs> no, you're not. No. Uh, but okay, so back to that feeling that you describe, um, and there were a couple of other things in there that I, that I noticed too. Uh, where do you just have a good imagination, or do you remember certain things it's and then apply them? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because I mean, I a, a lot of people I don't think could um, could be that. Like, you have to be um, aware of your own. You have to take notes as you go through life. Yeah. But this is what I do as I as I've gone through life. I take notes as to what certain things feel like, right. or what certain sounds make me think or feel or smells or whatever it may right. be. And I, and I don't know why, uh, but I've always kind of just like kept them tucked back in the back of my head. And I think it's for moments like this. If I ever write something, uh, I have to be able to put myself in the shoes of the characters I'm creating. So it, how do you, how did you do it? Well, you start typing. Um, I, I started writing this on an iPhone. Um, really? From the back of a hotel van coming from an airport to hotel or um, in line at Starbucks, uh, the passenger of a car. Wow. And, and then I, I hate finally, I, you know, <laughs> when I started on a laptop, you know, it became more, the, the thoughts became more organized. Yeah. But yeah, you, you've got to put yourself in there. And that's what I'm trying to do for the reader. It's like, you're there, you know, and uh, the book starts out. I don't know if you read the very beginning, but it starts out in the woods late at night. Yes. At uh, ten thirty at night, one yeah. of the one of the characters, I uh, won't say who, won't give details. He's wounded. He's delirious, and I want the reader to just 
jump into the story and feel like they're there. Yeah. I mean, we've all read great nonfiction books, uh, biographies of Robert E. Lee or General Meade, the one that Kent Masterson Brown just came out or whatever. Mm-hmm. And those are wonderful books, and we have to have those for a foundation for, for history, especially sure. for, you know, if you're going to be a novelist and tell stories, you better get your facts right. You right. Know? You don't want to just start throwing scenarios that aren't there. But with me, uh, nonfiction, after four, five, six pages, you know, I'm grabbing coffee or Coke or my eyes are wandering off. So but with fiction, I, I, I'm able to stay with it when I'm reading, you know, like whether it's, you know, Shara, Michael or Jeff or you know, Alex Racino wrote a great book a couple of years ago on Antietam called Six Days of September. And I think I read that in about two or three days. It was wonderful. And uh, but anyway, with with you just got to stay with it. And when you're writing, it's the same way you put yourself in the story. Whatever you have to do, you know, I find if you get up at 3 in the morning, you go make coffee, take a shower, you come out and get your coffee. I go down to the basement, get on the laptop, and I start typing away. Yeah. And I just lose myself in it. Next thing you know, it's 11 in the morning, and wife and dog want to go for a walk, and, you know, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm still typing. Right, okay. Catch the rest of this episode and support the show over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg.